Welcome, everybody, to Sunday's edition of the Collider Mailbag. I just finished some pancakes, walked over here, and I'm hosting the show. You know, it's Sunday brunch. I love to do it. Love to be asked to host the show because it's such a <laughs> such a good time answering y'all's questions. They always challenge us. It's always a good time. And yes, I'm wearing the same sweater as yesterday. Don't judge me. It's been a bad weekend. All right, so let's get going here. Uh, let's introduce everybody around the panel, please. Joined as I was yesterday by the amazing Perry Nemiroff. Welcome, Perry. She started all this. What's, is there a giggling uh, going on? Not giggle, giggle fan. All right, but seriously, game plan. <laughs> Sinead. When I blink both my eyes at the same time, you tossed a roca first. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I the like amazing it. Sinead? I like it. Hey, guys. Um, welcome. I'm so happy to be spending my Sunday brunch with all of you guys. Hello. <laughs> Remember brunch with the Beatles? Back in the old days, they had a thing called brunch with the Beatles. You listen to Beatles music while you're eating your pancakes. It was the great. The only thing we're missing from this brunch is yes. uh, food and mimosas. <laughs> <laughs> it's really just three dorks hanging out at a table. <laughs> and some That's waiter with a, a tie. Butter. Some waiter with a tie and a nice white. Uh, all right, so let's get going. Let's start it. Let's jump into it. Perry, what's our first question? <laughs> I mean, uh, Sinead, what's our first question? Jeez, give away my job. Sorry. Spit coffee all over oh my, my computer. Gosh. All right. We're going to try to keep it together now. Lando writes, hey, Collider crew, love you guys so much. Not a day goes by now without getting a fix from one of your shows. Okay, so let's pretend every living Marvel fan's dream has come true. Fox finally strikes a deal with Marvel Studios and the Fantastic Four come home to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Would you find it necessary to show the FF's origin again or go the route that Marvel has been taking with Spidey and just skipping the origin and have them already fully powered and ready to roll in the MCU? And two, the casting couch is open. Who would be your top choices to play Reed, Sue, Johnny, Ben, and Victor Von Doom? Thanks so much for everything you do. Oh, this is a good question. I don't think it's every living Marvel fan's dream come true. There are Marvel fans who don't like Fantastic Four as a property, either in comic form or on on movie uh, form. So it doesn't matter either way. I think it's just a, it's if you enjoy that property. So I like Fantastic Four, so this is a fun little game to play of recasting. Would I want to do an origin story? No. We all know it. We get it. We don't want to do it again. You see this, what they've been doing with Hulk. They launched him in separate movies, piece by piece, and they might give him his own solo film. We see going down the pike. Right. The reference to Spider-Man is correct. That's what they seem to be doing. They're just jumping right into it. He's already Spider-Man. Let's move on. Uh, for me, personally, I think Evan Rachel Wood would be fantastic as Sue Storm. I think she's really coming into her own as an actor actress even more so over the last few years and especially if you watch her stuff in Westworld I think she's fantastic I think John Bernthal should be grim Ben mm, Grimm Ben Bernthal's been really establishing himself powerfully through these smaller parts especially with Punisher now getting his own series he was great in Fury if you haven't seen that World War II film and I just saw The Accountant he was good once again in, in The Accountant so I think Bernthal deserves a shot and he brings that kind of like street gravitas to Ben Grimm, which has always characterized him. And I could imagine him saying, it's clobbering time, you know? Uh, and I think with uh, with Victor Von Doom, I think Kenneth Branagh would be fantastic. I don't know why they need to be contemporaries. I don't, I've never been a big fan of this idea that Doom needs to be a contemporary of Reed Richards. I know it's probably in the comics, but it's never been something I'm, I like the idea that Dom, Von Doom's a little bit older. Therefore, Reed Richards' intelligence is challenged more. It's more of a, a, a victim, I mean, it's more of a challenge for him to be able to uh, fight back against uh, Von Doom. Uh, Perry, what do you think? In regards to the origin story, I actually think I go the other way on mm. it because yes, we've seen we've seen yes. the origin story quite a few times at this point, right. but I don't really understand how they'd be able to introduce the Fantastic Four to the MCU audience. And I'm not talking about the diehard fans who know the source material, who have seen these movies hundreds of times. I'm talking about the wider audience, right. the audience that puts these movies across one billion worldwide. I think they might need a proper introduction to these characters. And I also like the idea of wiping the slate clean. The, the other movies, n none of them are really that good. No, they're so not. So I'd much rather see them start fresh, mm -hmm. reintroduce them all. And for a little dream casting, I feel bad for Toby Kebbell. <laughs> I feel really bad he for him. He can't seem to hit it. And he's and a good actor. He's a great actor. Yes. He also had really great ideas for Doom. So mm -hmm. part of me would want to give him another shot okay. of doing that character right. Although I think he would make a good fit for Reed as well. Yeah. Um, another actor that I'm really liking right now, and I like his sass on Scream Queens, is Glenn Powell. Okay. So maybe he could play Johnny. 
Okay. And then for Sue, I have Tatiana Maslany because we all know how much I love Orphan Black. Tatiana's great. And I think it's only a matter of time before she's a big movie star as well. Mm -hmm. As excited as I am to see Felicity Jones in Rogue One, the idea of her having oh, led that still man. is in the back of my mind. Yeah, I kind that's of a wish that point. that happened just a little bit. Yeah. And then another person that I'm a big fan of right now is Wyatt Russell. And I think he mm. can make a great Ben Grimm. He is so good. If you haven't seen him, just to name drop a couple things that he's in, yeah. I don't know how much Black mirror you guys have watched but he's the lead in the second episode of black mirror okay. he's great and everybody wants some and then i brought this up on nightmares this week too there's a cannibal movie that he's in called uh we are what we are it's a remake and mm -hmm. he's it's a small role but he definitely has a strong presence in that as well well do you now do you think uh, with the incredibles coming on right the incredibles didn't have any backstory and people bought it isn't that the same? It's basically a pseudo Fantastic Four movie. Why? Why did that work for you? Whereas you, whereas not seeing an origin film would not work for you. It is, but that that was still an introduction in a way to right. a new band of characters. Right, so but they were older and had already done it for a while, and you saw it in newspaper clippings, but you didn't see like how they got their powers. Like you still don't know how they ever became yeah. powerful. It's a, no, it's a very, it's a fair point. Right. I mean, I think whatever, whatever they did in the context of that movie worked well enough for me where it was a suitable introduction to them as people and them as a family. Right. Whereas a, a big part of the reason that they become who they are in Fantastic Four is because of how they got their powers. That's, yes. That's so much of the people they were and the people that they become. So I think it's, you need it a little more there. Okay. All right. All right. That's fair. Uh, any thoughts on this one, Sinead? I mean, I, I like origin stories, mm -hmm. but I said this before, if we're going to bring Fantastic Four back, we need to not do it for a while. <laughs> like, I need some time mm. to pass. I just don't think that... Um, right now is the right time for Fantastic Four at Marvel. Yeah. I don't think next year is the right time for Fantastic Four at Marvel, and I don't think the year after that. I'm thinking, like, when we do it, it needs mm -hmm. to, some time needs to have been passed. Wiping the slate clean, I think an origin story and, like, retelling the story would only work if yeah. we're talking, like, five years down the line mm -hmm. from now. And um, I like origin stories. I do I do like origin stories, um, especially with superhero, because I feel like they can be so cool and complex, and there's so many things that you can explore. Yeah. Plus, origin stories, like, allow for some really good, like, narrative telling, too, and how these characters became these characters. And I feel like um, that could work for Fantastic Four because we have so many people to explore. Mm -hmm. But you guys, like, let's not even bring it into the universe, please. Let's heal. We need time to heal. And I need, like, I need five years, and then I can get stoked. Okay. Would you be excited if next week there were, like, Fantastic Four in the works? Would anybody really be excited? I think if Marvel was taking it over, yes, I'd be excited. Because, oh my gosh, because it what, they, me. what they did with Spider Man we was I was brilliant. Say, we just did it yeah. with Spider Man. Yeah, I mean, it, it. it really it was that exact situation mm -hmm. where when did Amazing Spider Man 2 come out? 2014? Yeah, 2014. Was and that as bad as Fantastic Four? Uh, you Ugh. could argue that it was close. It was. Right, yeah. it was right. a maybe pretty I just bad. really. Maybe and I'm just still hurting from Fantastic. Well, Fantastic and that's Four coming from someone who really liked the first Amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. I had a lot of fun with that, and I thought yeah. Andrew Garfield made yeah. for a great Peter Parker. I agree. That second movie is not good. No, yeah. no, and they took what was really charming about the first movie and kind of buried it into the ground and yeah. made it way too big. They, hit, they tried they, to expand the universe. It hit the, way the they ground to. when Gwen Stacy's head hit the ground. Okay. <laughs> Too soon. Ouch. Too soon. <laughs> it's like my least favorite scene in any superhero movie ever. Ugh. I hate it. <laughs> it was the worst. Uh, yeah. But that is how she dies in the comics, so what are you going to do? All right, let's go to the next question. Kyle writes, hey, Clyder crew, love listening to your show after my lunch break. Mmm, lunch. <laughs> well, I liked... <laughs> We just we just had brunch, Harry. I mean, uh, Sinead. Yeah, I'm stuffed from all this fake air. Well, well, I liked all of your suggestions for directors for Deadpool 2. I was surprised no one mentioned Shane Black. He's great at action comedies and genre films, especially buddy cop stories, which more or less describes the relationship between Deadpool and Cable in the comics. Your thoughts? Very. All right. I'm not going to giggle through this whole line. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, Shane Black would have been an excellent suggestion. Yeah. He's having a killer year thanks to The Nice Guys. I still think it's one of the best movies of the year. Absolutely. I can't wait to see Predator. However, the train has left the station at yeah. this point. It seems like they are going to go for uh, uh, David Leach, Leach, uh, Leach, the director of John Wick. And the fact that that seems like such a perfect choice to me, 
I almost can't even wrap my as much as I like Shane Black yeah. I can't even wrap my head around him doing it at this point I am yeah. so excited about Leach being the front runner and even though it's not confirmed it does sound like this is the way it's going to pan out mm -hmm. he's in perfect shape to make this movie and make it Make it the way, I don't want to say make it the way it should be, because that's kind of the, the mm -hmm. issue that we ran into with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Tim Miller, mm -hmm. is that they did not agree with the direction the movie should head in in terms of doing something a little innovative and yeah. new versus doing what they did before that worked so well. And I think there's a case to be made for both of them, although I do understand why they went Ryan Reynolds' route, yeah. which is doing what they did before and doing it well. Yeah. And I think that... Uh, a guy who has so much experience in the stunt coordinating realm and so much experience behind the lens. He's been a, in addition to John Wick and the other movie he directed, he's been a second unit director on a lot of huge productions out there. I am so excited for him to be directing that movie that at this point, if this deal does not go through and he is not the official director of Deadpool 2, I can't imagine them finding someone else that I'll be equally as excited about. Yeah, Shane Black is a nice choice. It's an interesting choice. I love Shane Black to pieces. I've championed Kiss Kiss Bang Bang since that thing hit the theaters. And I've, I mean, I used to quote that with my friends all the time. That film is so brilliant. Nice Guys was so good, too. I think the problem missing is that Shane Black is just a little bit older. He's out of that realm. And I think what you have with, uh, with what Tim Miller did, Miller had a way of capturing the youthful essence of of Deadpool, of the of the of the smart ass Alec, uh, smart Alec uh, comments that he makes. Yes, there are moments like that in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. There are moments of that in The Nice Guys, but it isn't the entire film. And I think that's where the difference lies. Shane Black did great with Lethal Weapon. You take Lethal Weapon, you put that up against anything with uh, with uh, with uh, Deadpool, and it is just as good. And, and there's no way you can argue that. But what you got, what Perry Perry is com completely correct. David Leach is a great choice going forward if they sign him, if they go forward with him, because he has that kind of sensibility and he's young. He's got that. He's tapping into that market that understands. He knows the references that can be made, the little things they can play with, and I think it'll work better with him than it would with Shane Black. Although I would love to see a Shane Black Deadpool film. It doesn't mean as Ryan gets older, it can't be possible. And I think that would be fun to see. All right, what's our, what's our next question? Randall writes, Hey guys, been listening to you for almost two years now, and you have helped made long, boring work days slightly more bearable. My question for you is, what is your favorite death of a henchman, hmm. stormtrooper, or random goon or thug in a movie? For me, I would have to choose the last Nazi trying to kill Aunt Indiana Jones on the truck from Raiders of the Lost Ark. When he's holding onto the grill of the truck, the expression on his face as it gives away is priceless, followed by his arms and legs flailing around in the air as the truck runs him over, and last but not least, the over-the-top ugh cry he makes just gets me every time. That was really well done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 my two initial ones are, I forget the actor's name. He was on uh, ER, I think, for a long time without an arm. The red-haired guy in RoboCop when the <laughs> nuclear waste gets him and he's like, uh, uh, and he's running towards him. That's such a great, insanely <laughs> effective uh, unsettlingly death. I don't unsettling know his death. name, but all yeah. I can picture now is the episode when he gets his arm chopped off right. in ER. In ER, I'll right? never forget that. He was great on that show too. But that scene has always stuck with me since I saw that film in the eighties. Uh, I would say Luca Brasi in The Godfather. That was such a great uh, death scene. He's getting choked, and the his the way his jowls like it just exploded on his face. Uh, and I would say kind of cheating a little bit. Count Rugen in Princess Bride. I think. Mm. That's such a great death scene. He is kind of the main villain, although like you know, Prince Humperdinck is really the main villain. I think Count Rugen is is such a great death uh, because of the vengeance you feel from uh, Inigo Montoya as he's chasing him. Everything that's built up throughout the movie that when he finally kills him, it's it's such a great payoff. I went for groups of thugs, mm. goons, etc. And the first one I'm going to lay out there is Snowpiercer, the oh, train yeah. mm -hmm. sequence where they're going head to head and just so many of the bad guys bite it. That yeah. is one of the most brilliantly directed sequences where even though it's a whole group against another whole group, there's so many great little character mm -hmm. moments. And the way that entire movie is directed, it is so human and visceral. Every punch to the gut, you feel it. Mm -hmm. And that scene in particular has some of the most vicious action and it's just one of the best shot scenes in the entire film. Yeah. Similarly, I'm going to go with the elevator sequence in Cabin in the Woods. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. That's just the greatest thing ever. Yeah. I mean, as a horror lover, that is one of the best moments of just nameless, faceless, uh, kind of bad guys-ish, yeah. just getting torn apart by all these crazy creatures. Oh, I love it. And then one of my favorites ever is actually in Lost World Jurassic Park, the Raptor mm. Field. 
oh, when they're yeah. when they're running through the field yeah. and one by one they're just all sucked into the grass and then the raptor tail comes up. I love it. <laughs> uh, groups is great. That's, I didn't even think about groups because you could do uh, Crazy Eight Eights from Kill Bill. Mm -hmm. You could do the elevator scene in Captain America Winter Soldier yeah. when he takes out all those uh, guys yeah, in the sequence. elevator scene, right? That's great stuff. And uh, one of the samurai films that I really love right now, Quiet, 13 Assassins, such a great mm -hmm. end sequence. It's a 50-minute end battle. And Damn. all the henchmen get killed as you go through, and it's fantastic. Uh, so it's it's those are groups is a great thing to bring up here. Spoiler alert! About it. Yeah, hello. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a samurai film. <laughs> Just kidding. Next. All right. Brennan writes, hey, Glider crew, my question <laughs> nice revolves try, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> My question revolves around the possibility of a Boba Fett solo film. Like most of you, I think it would be a bad idea and would be much more interesting or interested in a bounty hunter or criminal underworld movie set in the Star Wars universe. But what would you think of a Boba Fett movie done in a similar way to Mad Max Fury Road, whereas the film follows someone else's story, like Furiosa, and Boba Fett is just along for the ride, not saying very much, but still being a badass like Max, mm. and maybe a hut in the immortal and Joe world. I'd love to hear your thoughts on my idea and if you think it could ever happen. Thanks a lot. Love your show and have a great day. I could picture it. Mm -hmm. I kind of do like that idea and I'm not one of the people who don't like the idea of a Boba Fett movie. I am obsessed with bounty hunters I l and a Mandalorian culture too. I just love the look of the armor. I like how it can be individualized. Yeah. I think there is so much potential in doing either a Boba Fett movie or some sort of bounty hunter movie. And I actually will agree. I think this is probably the idea that is best suited for a feature film is not to make it centralized on Boba Fett, but to do a, a group. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many things you it, it, it said in this question where the, the criminal underworld, because that's one thing in particular that the Star Wars movies have barely tapped into. Mm -hmm. And there's so much rich detail in the book. And one of my favorite things about Star Wars period is just the villain mentality. Because mm -hmm. I just finished reading Tarkin and it's it's one of, I don't love the book overall. Right. I don't think it's a perfect book by any means, but in terms of what it does for that character and how it conveys his mentality and who he was as a child, why he became what we know him to be in the movies. Yeah. I think that is just such rich material to explore. So anything involving villainy at this point or the criminal underworld in Star Wars, I want to see that. And I think bounty hunters are perfect for that kind of material. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I, I'm with you, Perry. I'm not one of these people that's against a Boba Fett standalone film. Being a Latino, I think he's Latino. So it's my personal opinion. I think Mandalorians are Latino. That's my personal opinion. It's correlative. Uh, but I would love to... But uh, this this theory, you're right. Uh, Brandon, is that his name? Brandon, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think this would, could, could totally work. And it would be adventurous. It'd be fun. You'd have another side of the huts. Like, people love these characters for a reason. So giving us two hours with them to, like, explore what they do explore them interacting with each other is just a wealth there's just a wealth of of great scenes that you could have mm -hmm. character scenes that you could have well written that it could have back and forth that would flesh out these characters even more for people to enjoy it's fun to know there are other huts out there yeah too. it's the large majority of the people out there only know Jabba right. it is a whole race yeah. I was just reading the uh, the Poe Dameron comic yeah. and there's there's a prison sequence that involves a hut and yeah. that's another element that is just not tapped into whatsoever yeah I, I mean you see it in more. you see it in the Clone Wars and then you see it now recently in the Free Maker Adventures, the one that they have, the oh, Lego yeah. one. They have a hut that's voiced by the guy who does Shake from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Mm. It's great stuff. So the huts are great to explore. There's, they're fascinating characters. So it would be cool. Uh, all right, what's our next one? Gary writes, hey guys, love the show. Having been in the movie news business for a while now and having heard thousands of breaking movie news stories, what is the one movie news item that I absolutely floored you when you heard it? In other words, what is your favorite movie news story of all time? Mine was when I heard that Disney bought Lucasfilm and announced that they would be making episode seven, something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. I was jogging when a friend texted me and I just had to sit down for a few minutes and take it all in. Thanks. Well, ironically, it would be when Phantom Menace was announced. I had no idea they were going to do another Star Wars film. It was so long after Jedi. When they announced it, I lost my mind because it was like, oh, we're going to get this again. We're going to like explore this again. We're going to go back in the universe again. So excited. Uh, counter, I mean, juxtapose that with when they announced the Disney, but I actually wasn't super excited about it because I was like, oh, are they going to make, uh, are they going to mess this up? Like, uh, you know, because of what happened with Phantom Menace, I was not super excited about it coming back. Uh, but obviously the reverse happened. 
I was disappointed by Phantom and loved uh, Force Awakens. So those are the things. And I would say Godfather 3 is another one. When they announced it, I was super excited because there hadn't been a Godfather since 1974, I think, or 72. And so to see that they were going to do another one in the 90s, I was so happy to see them going back into it. And of course, it wasn't the best result. So, uh, Barry? Mine, I guess, is probably the announcement of Jurassic World. Ah. I am, I'm a diehard Jurassic Park fan. Uh, nothing compares to the first movie, but... I do enjoy watching The Lost World, and I think mm -hmm. The Lost World actually deserves a little more credit than it gets. And mm, even yeah, though, I agree. even though Jurassic Park Three is is not a good movie, no, but I've are, I've yeah. watched it. There are great there, moments yes. in it. Kay Leone is great in that film. She's really good. I'm very entertained by that movie, so I'm fine with it. But there was such a, a long gap. It's similar to what you were just saying between mm -hmm. Jurassic World 3 and the announcement of Jurassic World. And when they announced that Jurassic World was going to be a fully operational version of the original park that John Hammond wanted to create, mm. mind blown. <laughs> I couldn't wait to see that. And Jurassic World did not meet my expectations. It was still exciting to see it. I think they kind of botched that really great idea. But again, it's like a Jurassic World 3 situation. Not yeah. as bad as Jurassic World 3, right. quality-wise. But I still enjoy watching it while knowing that it's not the greatest thing ever. But the other one that I need to point out, because it kind of changed my career within this mm. movie news realm, is the announcement of the Hunger Games movie. Because mm. at the time, I was working for an outlet where I was the only one who had read that book. So I became their official Hunger Games person. And you know, when you're a freelance writer in this industry and you become the official person for a property like that, that went on to do how many big casting yeah. stories? Every clip, every trailer, every poster, everything was news. I, I had all this work That's and great. it just completely changed the game for me. That's awesome. I would yeah. say the, the announcement of the Avengers movie too, I think mm -hmm. for most of us who are superhero yeah. fans, it was great to hear that they were gonna do that and what could they do with that? What about you, uh, Sinead? Um, well, like speaking recently, I would say one that really shocked me was um, uh, Fantastic Beasts because I was such oh, a huge yeah. Harry Potter mm -hmm. fan. And right. when I heard that there was even something to do with that world in any capacity, yeah. I was like, what? Because I honestly thought that that was all we were going to get from J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. I really did. I was like, mm, that's it. Like, that's she gave us that and we have to live with that for forever. Yeah. And but so that was really shocking to me. Um, and then even like Spider-Man being announced to be joining the MCU was a recent one that also was like mm -hmm. really exciting. But I think like one that always sticks out to me and it's so sad is um, the death of Paul Walker during Fast, oh, yeah. during filming uh, Fast and Furious. That one, mm. I think, was like such a shock. And yeah. um, although like devastating, I feel like in terms of a news story that's like stuck with a lot of mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. it's been one of those because we were like anticipating a, a, a new movie and like we had to talk about it so much because that's our job, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But that was one that I think I remember exactly what I was doing when I heard about yeah, it. I remember yeah. I was like cooking dinner like in my kitchen or something, like in the best mood with my sister. And I remember getting that text. And I don't know if it's just because I loved Paul Walker so much, but I remember exactly what I was doing and like what I did for the rest of the night, like dealing with that news. I was yeah. devastated. Same thing with Heath Ledger too. I remember oh, yeah. I was at school, mm -hmm. I was in high school. I remember like getting in trouble for being on my phone mm -hmm. because I was so obsessed with Heath Ledger at that time as well. It's yeah. awful, but yeah. I know I'm sorry to bring it down. I know, right? Like, bring it yeah. down so much, but in terms of news headlines, bring the mimosas back. So we bring the mimosas back. Yeah, bring the mimosas back. Sorry. Bit, uh, yeah I, mean, I think the uh, who's the first one you mentioned that passed away? Oh, Paul Walker. Paul Walker. Yeah, uh, that was during that time when people were doing hoaxes about people's deaths. Yes, remember? And yes. so I thought it was a hoax. I thought it was for a hoax a at first time. too. Yeah. yeah, it was awful. Yeah, and then I then totally you, forgot about that. But yeah. you're so right. So many people were being supposedly, and then you're like, no, that can't be right. And well, yeah, news outlets. I remember. Yeah, news outlets had said it was a joke at first they mm -hmm. were like don't believe everything because it was the same time that Chloe Grace Moretz had that awful yes. hoax about her too and everyone That's said right. that she died it was like number one trending on Twitter yeah. and she was so offended because she had to her parents and like her family were like what the hell is going on she yeah. had to call her family so I rem I totally forgot yeah. about that yeah. just got a little crazy <laughs> 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 look, at the, look at this screen you guys wait Cody go to all three of us look at this ready 
Well, that's a great way. Does it look like a? I don't look like a crazy person in the interview. Now we're not sad anymore. All right. Next one. Okay. Anyways, you're welcome. Keith Johnson writes, Hey, Collider Crew, love your shows. My question is regarding the main villain for the upcoming Justice League movie, Steppenwolf. Am I alone in feeling that the iconic group of DC heroes in their first major team movie has a villain that is nowhere near as iconic as any of the heroes? I love almost all the superhero films and TV shows and animated cartoons, but I very rarely heard of Steppenwolf. Lex, Brainiac, Darkseid, um, is that Ares? Yeah, Ares. Uh, Parallax and Joker are names that come to mind for big time villains, in my opinion. Do you think the DC thought she was, wait, <laughs> um, do you think, uh, I don't know what this is asking. Do you think DC thought she was with, uni- no, sorry, yeah. I'm not helping. Do you think DC, uni- let's just go to this, do you think DC dro- universe dropping, dropped the ball? Are they dropping the ball basically using for using a lesser known villain? Um, I don't think they're dropping the ball. I don't want to, you know, make any assumptions. I think yeah. it's whatever they do with this character and I don't, I don't want to, you know, keep bringing back this issue, but we're constantly talking about the Marvel villain problem. Yeah. And the only thing they can do to fix it is to introduce a villain, to give him some good character development and make him memorable. Yeah. If they do that with Steppenwolf, great. However, as someone who doesn't know the source material, when I first heard the name Steppenwolf, I'm like, huh? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I read up on it, but right. again, this goes back to the issue of we're, we're a minority compared to the greater world, and that greater world is what sends these movies north of a billion dollars at the box office. Right. People are not going to get excited about Steppenwolf quite like they would the Joker or Lex Luthor. Mm-hmm. It's just a simple fact. Yeah. There's no reason to think, though, that DC can't do Steppenwolf justice and make that character almost as iconic as those two others, but within the feature film realm. I mean, the question you have to ask is, how many people knew about Thanos? How many people knew about Ronan walking mm-hmm. in the Guardians of the Galaxy? You didn't. Yeah. You just, I mean, a major, it's a small percentage that did. Mm-hmm. Absolutely small percentage that did. So you walk in there and you're like, who are these people? Who are these people? You're being introduced to a bunch of new characters. I bet, I bet a majority of people didn't know who Guardians of the Galaxy were. And then you see two new villains that you had. You had seen Thanos, obviously, in different films, but you never really see him speak or have anything. It's only in Guardians that you start to get a little taste of the power that he has. So with Steppenwolf, What's interesting with him is that it's a good blank slate. And like you were saying, Perry, not a lot of people are going to know him. And But he's superhuman power. He's a military tactician. There's a lot that happened with that character. There's a lot of ties to Darkseid, ties to Doomsday. There's all that mixed in. So there's shades of these other characters that are well-known villains that will add to the allure. But... It's an unknown quantity. So therefore, if you cast the right actor and you develop that actor correctly, develop that character correctly to play Steppenwolf, then you will have a very powerful villain because you don't, because the thing is, the focus of Justice League is about establishing the characters, establishing them as heroes because it's very, these are more iconic than the Avengers, I think, the Justice League are. So you got to spend time building them up. But if you make a villain that's going to take the spotlight away from them, I think you have a danger of undercutting the film. Maybe you, maybe that's the exact opposite that's happening. Maybe they purposely went with someone who has all the potential in the world but isn't as well known because yeah. this movie is also responsible for introducing Aquaman, Cyborg, and The Flash. Yeah. So more time and attention to be paid to them, or at least leading up to yes. the movie. You know, our focus yes. should be on them and not necessarily on Steppenwolf at this point. Yeah. Yep. Anything here, Sinead, or yep. do you want to move on? <laughs> oh, um, no, I was like, what? I like when she's got an arm full just looking back between and both was, of us. No, I just agree, I agree with everything you yeah. guys are ever are saying. Um, it's like a debate forever. teacher listening to us in debate teacher. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, wow, <laughs> my co-hosts are just so smart. Oh, my God. No, but seriously, though, um, yeah, I think that when in terms of villains, in this particular circumstance with Justice League, it comes down to the fact that um, for me, I'm okay with a lesser known villain because I haven't met half of my Justice League cast. Mm. That's honestly what it is. If it was like Justice League 5, I'm like, all right, up the stakes, get me excited, you know? But it's not, like this is, we're really just getting into the DC EU like really, really now, and especially next year. And I'm okay with focusing on my main characters, but also um, I think that that's less pressure yeah. Um, it's just yeah. less pressure. That's a great point. Yeah. 
All right, what's our next one? Nico writes, Hi, Collider team. My name is Nico, and I'm from Germany. I'm a big Star Wars fan, and I don't really believe in fan theories. Why can't Snoke just be Snoke? I also don't believe that Rey is Luke's daughter. But when I saw this new theory, Palpatine is Rey's grandfather, I thought this might be true. In the video, they show that Rey's and Palpatine's fighting styles are the same. And in the book, a mysterious voice told Rey to kill Kylo Ren. Was that the Force ghost of Palpatine? Do you think she could be Palpatine's granddaughter? Almost in every Star Wars movie, we had a Skywalker versus Palpatine. Maybe we will have uh, that again with Kylo versus Rey. And maybe Rey was on Jakku because her family was hiding her from the Skywalkers. This is an interesting question, right? Because if they do kind of turn this on its head, this idea of uh, Skywalker versus Palpatine, like to turn it on its head, it'd be fascinating. If you have Rey being the one who isn't tempted to the dark side, where Kylo, where Kylo is, and the reason isn't because she's a Skywalker, the reason is because she's a Palpatine. It's such a juxtaposition in that she turns her back on the evil legacy of her family while Kylo wants to embrace it more, at least from what we've seen in the film. So these, 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 theories, that, these theories that have, like I always love this kind of stuff because it, it takes intelligence to look at these things, kind of find them. To, if you're not like twisting them into pretzels to make it work, then it's actually really, really good. Perry, what do you think about this? This video that they're yeah. referencing is one of the best fan theory videos I've ever seen. I right. forgot why I was Googling around and looking for something like this. I think it was a Twitter question on Jedi Council or something. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that video, that was the first time that I thought to myself, I, I buy it. And not yeah. only do I buy it, I kind of want it to happen. Yeah. One, because it's a very cool and satisfying tie to previous movies. And two, because it makes sense, and then three, because it would enhance her character. Mm -hmm. That is a genius way to really enrich Rey in a way that is satisfying for people who know all the previous characters in the previous movies. It just, it makes sense. It makes sense from any angle you look at it, and that is, <laughs> I, I wish I had that video still open so I could yeah. give the creator of that video credit. I do. Uh, Vincent, Ven Vincent Vendetta. So yeah. if you haven't seen this video, which is titled Palpatine is Ray's Grandfather, you need to watch that because it's just a really well-made video and yeah. I'm just, what I, are I the admire views like that person. That? I've heard about it. It's it's over a million. Yeah. yeah People surprised. have been talking very, about it a lot lately. A very well done video mm -hmm. that states the case very clearly and, and does it in a way where not only does the theory make sense, but I think the movie and the characters would be better off for it. Yeah, they go deep into her fighting styles. They talk about her accent. They talk about how she knows her, because how Kylo knows her because of her force power in the novelization of the movie. That's important too, because we didn't get that in the movie, right? We see it, we can read it in the novel, and all that is canon. All that is canon, what's in the novel. And this whole idea that she's been part of Star Wars for a long time, like all of it is just, would totally hit all the buttons and check all the boxes, but it would turn it on its head, which mm -hmm. would be so inventive. Something that's said in that video that I also think just, you know, almost like a fan fiction yeah. kind of way where I see a play out in my mind. And still, even though they say it in the video, I think still in real life, I'd be like, holy shit, if this happened, right. is with all the talk of Rey being Luke's daughter, which I still completely out of the realm of possibility. I don't okay. think it's ever happening. But after everybody talking about it, imagine if we all sit down for the movie and then it's like, no, she's his granddaughter. Right. You know, yeah. like just even thinking about that playing out, even though we've discussed it to death, it's not taking any of the magic away from it whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. And you, yeah, it just, it's, it would be great if that would be such a, a ballsy thing to do. All right, what's the next one? Pedro writes, Hi, Clyder crew. I would like to know if you have a sequel to a movie that you'd really like to see. For me, I would love to see a Tropic Thunder sequel, one of my favorite and most underrated comedies. Best regards and keep up the great work. A silly one to start. <laughs> I want to see a Billy Madison sequel. Oh, my God. Like, all grown up, Billy Madison as a family. I don't know. College. I don't know what he's doing. He has a kid. I, he has a kid through college or something, maybe. The thought of Adam Sandler making another movie, you know, with that style of comedy, given his recent body of work, is kind of mortifying. And I would never <laughs> want it to be ruined because I love Billy Madison. Right. But I do want to see him all grown up. Yeah. But more seriously, I wanted the District 9 sequel that never happened. Mm. I really, really, really love that movie. And I thought it ended in such an interesting place. And it's kind of unfortunate that... He went and made, uh, was it Elysium right Elysium, after? Elysium, yeah. Which is fi uh, fine. You know, it was entertaining enough. Yeah. It didn't really do it for me quite like District 9 did, no. but I wanted to see the next chapter in that story. He said a law of diminishing returns because Chappie wasn't that interesting either. Well, oh, do you like Chappie? I, yeah, I am. Wow. Okay. I am probably one of the biggest Chappie fans in this building. <sighs> wow. I, 
I like it quite a bit. Okay. And I think he deserves a little more credit than he got for that movie. Right, I think he ahead. deserves more credit overall because even Fair though, enough. you know, I'll admit that Elysium isn't yeah, the I greatest like movie. Elysium. I still think there's so many signs that you could point to in that movie that just show that Neil Blomkamp is a talented director Absolutely. who should be getting more big work. Yeah. But one other one I want to throw out, kind of cheating, not really movies, or we're allowed to discuss TV on Mailbag. Sure. Not cheating. I want to see the, wait, how much Black Mirror have you guys watched? Uh, Uh, Three episodes. Yeah, I'm not that far. I'll just be vague about this because I can't spoil it for the viewers either. But the last episode in Black Mirror, it's called Hated in the Nation. It's my favorite episode Mm -hmm. of the new season. And I think it is really freaking interesting. There is a certain character in the end, and I really like that character, and I want to see the next step of that character's journey. Do you have to watch the other ones to enjoy the ones before? No, it? no. Oh, so they're and not oh a my line. god, that you okay. know, I didn't even realize because when someone first taught me about Black Mirror, yeah. I I was just taught that it is. I knew going in that it was an anthology, not in terms of American Horror Story where every season is different, but where every episode is different and they function as their own stories. There's themes that overlap, but each episode is its own individual story. I didn't realize that people didn't get that. And there's actually a lot of people out there who have asked me that same question. No, you could go in and watch episode six and go back to episode one. It doesn't even matter. I happen to think that going straight through is a a nice way to do it just because... You know, just in terms of the level of suspense and the scope of the stories, I think they do pair well yeah. in a way where yeah. it does feel like a really fluid watch, even though they're completely different stories with different characters. But I'll say that last one, it's a longer episode. It's 90 minutes. And that okay. is an episode not just because it's 90 minutes, but just yeah. because of the scope of that episode. I think that deserves to be screened on the big screen. Uh, for me, it would be Unbreakable 2. That was a film that ended with the potential to be a superhero franchise without capes without tights, without any of that stuff. He was just a power, and Glass, Mr. Glass is such a great villain introduced right at the end of Sam Jackson being pulled, just all of it is such a brilliant ending. It's a criminally underlooked and underappreciated Shyamalan film, and it should have been, uh, it should have had a sequel to it. Uh, Elf, I think, should have had a sequel, should yeah. have a sequel, I think it's still possible. They mm-hmm. had a child, that's certainly possible oh, now. Oh, I would love that. that. Right, it would be great to have a little Christmas sequel with Elf and ha- what happens with their child, and what, uh, try, trying to live both in the Elf and the human world. Now, knowing both parents are Elf or in human, or uh, both, they're both human, but he's kind of Elf in terms of that. Uh, I would say Leon the Professional seeing Mm -hmm. a sequel with Natalie Portman now as uh, Hitman having learned you know going to revenge finding out who really set up Leon's death and one quietly my favorite 80s buddy cop film Mm -hmm. that did not get a sequel Running Scared with Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines they I I went to see a screening of it at the New Beverly Cinema with Peter Hyams who directed the film and he said that they tried to hash out a sequel for two years and either Hines or Crystal couldn't agree to do the script because they didn't think it was quite there and it was a lost opportunity that if you haven't seen Running Scared from 1980s, not that Paul Walker film, the one from 1980s, it's such a fantastic, fantastic, fun 1980s buddy cop film, and I, they should have done the sequel to it. And that's my uh, Sinead, What do you have? Um, well, I used to be the queen of talking about how I felt like the fact that The Incredibles not having a sequel mm-hmm. was the biggest crime yeah. to ever happen to animated movies. Right. Um, true. It was literally like I rejoiced. I'm pretty sure I shed a couple tears because for the longest time after that movie, I was like why is no one talking about the possibility of a sequel? And then mm. 10, 15 years passed, and you're like, <laughs> wait, what? Um, I've also talked about this before. We had a similar question about a month ago, but I really liked Tron, and I was actually wait, looking the, the forward. the one that came out? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, agreed. I think Tron, the remake, came out at the wrong time. I think yes. that it wasn't appreciated because... It was just not the right time for that movie. And I think if that same movie was released now, Mm -hmm. it would have been so different. Um, Also, the fact that it has one of the greatest soundtracks in the entire world. Um, Yeah, and just just incredible style and effects. It was was in the wrong year. Like, I really think... And then I was really stoked that they were still... It was still a huge success. I think it made, like upwards of $400 million yeah. or something like yeah. that. People talked about it. And so yeah. they were going to do a Tron 3, and mm-hmm. it was um, Disney announced Garrett it. Headland and uh, uh, Olivia Wilde. Yeah, Olivia Wilde coming back, yeah. And then they tabled it. And yeah. their reasonings for tabling it, I remember, um, were just like, we weren't sure 
when we were going to release it and we're not quite sure like where this could go so right. for now we have such a big slate and we're going to put it on the back burner and that was over a year ago a year and a half ago yeah. so i'm still holding out for the hope hmm. that we could see a tron 3 i love that movie and i think it just i think it was really underrated it's interesting because tron uprising the animated series was also underrated that's a fantastically intelligent well done well done animated series that ex really pushed the boundaries of animation right. in terms of writing and in terms of animation mm -hmm. and so to, so it's just interesting that Tron is, by its fans, very fervently devoted People fans. People who like Tron really yeah. like Tron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's why I think there should be some kind of market for it. I absolutely agree with you. I right. think that second film was criminally destroyed. It uh -huh. shouldn't have been. Uh -huh. It's good. And I'm uh, so happy you agree with me. <laughs> Makes me feel I, I had really strong feelings about that movie. I like, like that you do. I yeah. you know I love that we discover that about each other. Uh, all right, so that's our show for this Sunday. <laughs> Please, uh, thanks so much for watching with us. Uh, whenever you're watching it, um, we really appreciate your questions come in. Always send them in. Like I said every like I say every time, they challenge us, they push us to look and explore, and they reinvigorate our love for film and our love for actors, which is such a great thing to have you guys help us do as well. Let's go around the table and tell everybody where they can find you. Perry? Well, I'm at a cold brew, so you could probably find me at Starbucks. And then you can also <laughs> find me on Twitter and Instagram at P Nemiroff, Collider Nightmares every Tuesday and best of the week every Saturday. And Sinead? Where do you keep your cold brew? Because you're always like refilling. I <laughs> I'm not refilling here. I come with like a carry tray of with course. enough to get me through the day. I oh actually never leave gosh. the office. I wow. just plan ahead. Wow. Yeah. You mean to tell me you order like four tall cold brews? And you no, just have well, it? today I only got two. Oh my gosh. Jeez, I eat one and I'm going off the wall. Yeah, me yeah. too. They're good. They water it down. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah it's good. not like straight cold brew. Yeah, because I would rip um, things apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys can find me online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. It's today, Sunday, right? Yes. So tomorrow we're here for TV Talk for Halloween, hosting a special Halloween episode. We're going to be dressing as each other as the fans chose. Um, so it's going to be really good. You guys are going to want to tune into that. And then Friday, I'm back for Movie Talk. Um, if you guys don't come back to Collider tomorrow, which I hope you do, have a wonderful and safe Halloween, please. Yeah. Um, and then you guys can catch me online. Actually, did I say that already? Yes. <laughs> All right. Then never <laughs> mind. No, Just have a happy Halloween say and uh, <laughs> trick or treat. Uh, Actionade to freeze. Uh, that's Actionade.com. Donuts. Okay. Donuts. That's pretty Steven. much everything. About uh, gosh, me. <laughs> you can always find me at the Roca says uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, Sunday nights we do the Walking Dead recap review show. Uh, I feel like I feel like it's some kind of like recap and review. Like I feel like when I say that, but they, we do it every Sunday night after <laughs> the show airs that be the from the thing. East Coast. <laughs> you should do it. You should do it. The Walking Dead <laughs> recap and review. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we do that every Sunday night. Perry and I are on there with a uh, with a uh, with the uh, McCuga. With Josh McCuga, and then a, a cycling fourth person every week, which is such a blast, <laughs> uh, invigorating the show. Uh, also, um, Cinephiles, my podcast, where we break down one classic film before the year 2000. There you can get on iTunes, and also Super Animation Game Time, 1 p.m. every every Wednesday on the Geek and Sundry Twitch channel. Uh, we interview people from the world of animation, voiceover, and video games. Yet uh, again, our outros are longer than the show. Uh, yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, Success. where did you get your cold brew? <laughs> you should do a new opening for Walking Dead. Uh, uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time, and we will see you next time on Collider Mailbag. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.